this is the last talk, so I guess that all of you are very tired. I will try to be funny, so I will not lose you. Um, welcome to the talk about tales about Scala performance. Um, my name is Chaim Yadid, which when it comes to an English uh, session, it is very hard to pronounce in English. Obviously, nobody thought about it in the design time. <laughs> so um, it is not an, a good name for an English-speaking audience. However, it is easily translatable. So Chaim means life and fr uh, and the Adid means friend, so basically you can call it a friendly life. But my nickname is usually shorter, it's called Lifey. That's how you can find me on the internet. So that's my first computer. It was a Commodore 64, 25 years ago. Um, I was um, a shy computer geek at high school. It was performing perfectly. No performance problems whatsoever. 25 years later, I'm still a geek, I'm married, I have two beautiful children, uh, I have a dog and a cat, and I'm working on, a very, on very sophisticated uh, applications, and the performance is awful. This is, by the way, a uh, scholar representation of my life. It ends with a nil. Um, so... Five years ago, I've decided to follow my heart and uh, started to focus on, on my passion, my real passion, is, which is performance, po performance problems. Um, basically, it really uh, fits my personality because I'm lazy and I'm impatient. So if something doesn't work fast enough, I really get crazy and I will do anything that I can um, to make it run faster. Uh, in the last five years, I'm an independent consultant. I've been involved in many optimization pro uh, uh, projects in Israel and outside of Israel. And um, basically, Performizit is offering uh, several services, um, which includes performance optimization, um, all stuff of concurrency, crashes, garbage collection tuning, and when you have... Uh, any kind of crashes problem on, and also offering training and mentoring. Um, so if you want to contact me, that's the way to do it. Um, if you want to uh, talk to me after the talk, it's also possible. But let's start now. Once upon a time, once upon a time means the last 13 years when I was working in Java, and in the beginning, I really thought Java is cool. It was an amazing programming language. It could do a lot of things that I couldn't possibly believe it could do. Well, I used to work in C and C++, and it was quite awful to find memory leaks, quite awful to understand why pro your program is crashing. And Java was a very amazing programming language. However, time has passed and Java now is not the cutting edge technology. I mean, the JVM is, is really amazing thing, but Java as a language is not such an amazing thing and it's really left behind after a lot of uh, other programming languages. The first time I heard about Scala was about five years ago. Um, it was in Java One conference and I heard a session about Scala. I said, wow, interesting, and immediately forgot about it. The next thing I, I, I start thinking about Java was about a year ago when I started to be involved in a Ruby project, which proved to be an, quite an amazing language until, until you try to optimize it. It says so many um, um, high-end um, language f uh, functionality which Java doesn't have and it's really hard to go back to such a primitive language after you work with Ruby but when you come to try to optimize it it is a nightmare. This is when I started to look at Scala and um, right now um, 
I'm really interested and really enthusiastic about the functionality of it and what it can do when, when it re relates to performance. So, a few a time ago, uh, there is a Google benchmark uh, which says that basically Scala performance is in par with Java performance. The best performance you can get is from C++. If you really want to do it, enjoy. You probably stay all night in the office. But if you try to choose Java or Scala, there is no performance problems. And you can rest assured that you can get the same performance as in Java. So we are done. You can go home. But I want to talk about different things. What I really want to talk about is not best practices. I'm not a believer in best practices because if you don't know what you're doing, best practices are going to be the worst practice that you're going to have. I'm not going to talk about micro benchmarks. Micro benchmarks are very hard to produce and be created correctly. And usually they don't mean much to your program. What I'm going to talk about is understanding and tooling how you're going to find performance problems in your Java in your Scala application, how are you going to solve them, and how are you going to reach a performing production system. Um, I assume that it's not the first time that you hear about the JVM, and you have some basic uh, uh, understanding of how the JVM works. In addition, I guess that it's not the first time that you hear about Scala. So what is performance all about? Performance is, first of all, requirements. Performance is one of the requirements of your product. If you don't have performance requirements, then the performance is good by definition. If you want uh, to make sure that your performance is good for your customers, you need to define requirements for performance. After you have requirements, what you need to do is to find hotspots. You need to understand where the bottlenecks of your problems, of your application. Where are your problems? And then you need to isolate them. You need to analyze them, and you need to find a solution. And for this, you need tools. Tools are your best friends for this task. Luckily, Scala runs on the JVM just like any other as Java application, therefore, you can take your friends with you. Or the friends that you had for optimizing and solving performance problems in the Java world basically still apply for Scala applications. This does not mean that you are going to start to, premature or to do premature optimizations. This means that if someone specifies that some kind of, uh, of language feature is more performant than another language feature, or said that specialization is pro problematic and boxing is problematic, it doesn't mean anything. What you really need to do is to develop a, a program that it, it is easy to maintain and simple as possible and optimize just where you believe when you get input from tools that direct you that performance problems resides in. So the JVM is a Java virtual machine and it runs your code in what starts as a bytecode, and then it compiles it through an optimizer, which is called a JIT, to, um, to assembly code. The process is done at runtime, and it runs every time um, you start the JVM. Basically, one of the things that it's very important to do when you run a JVM is to monitor it. You need to understand how it is functioning and that he has enough resources and behaving correctly. The JVM exposes an API called JMX, Java Management Extension, which is avail available for every JVM, including Scala applications. Of course, every modern JVM, but we're talking about modern JVMs. So in the JMX protocol, uh, you expose the inner state of your 
JVM, including memory, CPU, etc. And you can consume it with external tools. One of the tools is called JConsole. It is part of the JDK. It, you can query everything that you have exposed in JMX. The other one is JVisualVM, and the third one is called Mission Control, which is a tool of the JRocket JVM. So, given that you have uh, ability to connect with uh, to a process in a, in, a, in to a Java process uh, using JMX, you can monitor and understand what's going on in your process in your Scala application. It is very important to enable remote monitoring via JMX in your production, meaning that you need to to transfer parameters to your JVM that will open a port so you can connect from remote. It's extremely important when you have a headless machines, like a Linux or something like that, that doesn't have a UI, so you can connect from remote and query it to understand what's going on in it. Just to mention, Scala as a platform over Java does not add any specific JMX as any managed beans additionally to what you have in Java originally. But you really need, even if you run Scala applications, to open this port. If you need uh, authentication at SSL, you can add it over there. But it will enable you to connect to your JVM remotely and see what's going on there. So let's start with the tails. The first thing I want to ta talk about is stack. As you all know, Scala is a functional programming, and as a functional programming, it means that it really likes recursion. So probably your first Scala program will look like that. Sum of squares, if starts is bigger than end, returns zero. If it's smaller or equal to end, take multiply a start by itself and compute sum of square of start plus one. Very simple, very understandable, very easy to write and run. So if, you, if that's your first program, your first exception is going to be this. Stack overflow exception. Okay, that's really what happened to me in my first Scala program. Um, when you have recursion that it's too deep, you are probably going to get a stack overflow. However, there is a notion that you should know about. It's called tail recursion. Tail recursion is a specific kind of recursion when the call to the function retu is returned as a value. For example, this recursion is not a tail recursion because it returns number equals factorial of number minus one. Okay, it re doesn't return the call to the function. But any, it's not correct that any, but a lot of recursion functions can, recursive functions can be turned on into uh, tail recursion functions like this one. Instead of adding the, the multiplication of ST by itself, that just put it as a parameter. And in this case, sum of squares is returned as a value of the function. The JVM cannot optimize tail recursion, but the Scala compiler can. As a result, this function is going to be iterative and you will not get stack overflow and you will not pay penalty of call to functions. The annotation tail rec at the beginning does not instruct the compiler to do anything, but if it is, the, is not possible to compile to a tail recursion, if it cannot be tail recursion, it will throw an exception. It will not compile, okay? So if you are expecting um, that a function will have tail recursion and someone tries to change it, that it will not be tail recursive anymore, the tail rec annotation will fail the compiler. Even with uh, tail recursion, you will still have more recursion than 
uh, you will have in Java applications. So it is recommended that you will increase your stack size in case you need it. It is possible to configure the stack size of a JVM in case you have a lot of recursion and you experience stack overflow problems. The size of the stack size of a JVM depends on the JVM version and on the platform. It can vary from 256K to one megabyte. And in case that it doesn't um, suffice for you, you can increase it with this parameter to the JVM. Regarding stacks, as you all know, Scala compiles its code to bytecode. And when it does it, it just like losing all the, the Scala additional uh, representations. This means that when Scala code runs in the JVM, you don't see the Scala stack. You will see some kind of a Java stack, which is not always very uh, easy to understand. For example, if you call to a list method, you will probably see the, the class colon colon, okay? which is not very easy to understand. Of course, when you get used to it, you will be able to, to understand what every class means, but it doesn't will be the same as your application. Currently, there is no uh, standard tool in the, in the Scala toolset that will convert uh, stacks of Java, JVM to stacks of uh, Scala. Of course, the, the, your best friend for, for displaying stacks of an application will be the tool JSTAC. It is part of the JDK. And given a process ID, it will dump the stack trace of all the threads in your application. Who have used JSTAC in the live? OK, if not, please do. It's very nice. It can help you understand what your pro application is doing. If you do it three times, you can understand what it is doing three times in a row, which tells what it's good doing generally. Uh, I have a about yeah. The there is a tool yes, uh, I will get to it in a second. OK. Um, so it can show you the stacks of all the threads, and it also can detect in case you have a deadlocks, not like you are going to have the deadlocks in Scala since you're using immutable objects. OK. Going back to Shai's comment, there is a tool which is not part of the, of the Scala stack, but it is developed by a, a startup called Takipi. This tool actually takes the horrific uh, stack traces of Scala applications and co convert it to something really nice that also uh, simplifies the, 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 the visibility of what's happening in your stack trace. It is, you need to go to a website to put your stack trace in it and run it, and you will get a very nice output. So that was the tales about stack. And now I'm going to talk about heap. For that, I have a rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the heap. Humpty Dumpty had an out of memory flip. All the king's horses and all, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty again. Together again, sorry. In a perfect world, you will not see out of memory. Uh, who lives in a perfect world here? Who saw an out of memory here more than once in his lifetime? Probably everyone. Out of memory is something that you're going to see one way or another unless you write a very trivial application. It happens when the heap, where, which is where the objects are allocated, is depleted, or your permanent generation, where, where the bytecode, the classes that you use, is depleted. And when it happens, it usually throws an exception, and it's a very bad situation for your JVM. Usually, you will need to increase the heap size and see how much memory that you need for your application. And so obviously, uh, getting an out of memory error indicates that you don't have enough memory, or you have a memory leak in your application. 
What you really need to do, and I really recommend all of you, even if you use small applications, is to add a parameter to the JVM. Of course, you know that you can, if you want to add it to the Scala command line, you need to add minus J in front of every parameter that I give to you. If you want to go on Scala, it's minus J minus XX, blah, blah, blah. And the parameter that I want you to add to every program that you run is heap dump on out of memory error. It means that whenever you get an out of memory, you will dump the entire state of the memory, which can be analyzed afterwards. The best tool ever in the world, in the universe, for analyzing memory dumps is called Memory Analyzer Tool. It is a free tool that is built on the Eclipse technology, and you can download it, download it from Eclipse. Um, it can be a plugin of your Eclipse uh, IDE, but I recommend to, to run it as a, as a standalone tool. And it can help you to understand if you have memory leaks, if you're using too much memory, and uh, of course, when you have out of memory error. There are some commercial alternatives for it, but they don't even come close to, this, to his abilities. As I said before, um, the notion of, of uh, Scala classes is really disappeared when it comes to the JVM. So you will not be able to see um, classes of Scala in the way that you are used to in your code. However, there is a tool written by Julian Dragos from TypeSafe, which is called Mat Name Resolver. Uh, actually, he really helped me in understanding how to use it. It takes uh, objects of Scala and it can represent them in a better way so you can understand what in them like for example if you have a list it can show you what there is in the list the tool is very in an initial state but it is open source and you can improve it to have better understanding of how your Scala application is behaving so for example, right now, if you have a list with 1,000 elements, it will look like 1,000 objects of colon, colon, okay, in your uh, memory. And the tool will print that this is actually a list. Currently, it doesn't print that it is a list of integers, but only the integers, but only that it is a list of integers. Um, it is possible to improve it. Um, so, regarding memory and memory consumption of Scala, you shouldn't expect larger memory consumption of a Scala application compared to Java. Uh, basically, with one exception, as you know, specialized uh, classes are derived from the original classes, meaning that a specialized object is actually larger than uh, the original object, okay? Because it contains all the members of, of the original object and the specialized uh, variation of them. But I don't think that it's something that you can, should pay a lot of attention to. But when compared to, to Java, Scala should consume much more memory in the permanent generation. The permanent generation is where you store and hold all your uh, bytecode, the code. And basically a class of Scala, which is very short, can create a lot of memory. From sev several reasons. The first reason is the Scala signature. Every class of Scala has an attribute, an annotation, which contains metadata on the class itself that is erased after compilation. This is needed for compiling of the Scala compiler. It's also needed for reflection, the Scala reflection. Okay, you are not able to get all the data on Scala um, objects without this. You are not able to reflect on their original behavior from the 
from the generated bytecode, so you will need to add another property. This consume memory in the permanent generation. In addition, a class of Scala can be turned into a lot of classes in the JVM, real classes of bytecode, because closures are actually not function. Functions are not first class citizens in the JVM. Closures are turned into classes and also implicit conversions are classes and also companions ob objects are classes. So if you take, for example, these four lines of code of Scala, you will get this class and this class and this class and this class, okay? Four lines of code of Scala is actually all this code in Java bytecode. It means that you can write very small Scala programs and still you will consume a lot of permanent generation. In addition, the specialized, uh, I think Eugene talked about it a few minutes ago, the specialized annotation means that for every class that is specialized, you can get um, many, class, many specialized classes eventually. And if you have several specialized properties, you will probably uh, get into a blow up of classes. For example, if you, you, you specialize three properties of a class, you could get thousands of classes created without even noticing it. So, I think that I have a bug in the presentation. Um, there should be a slide here that showed how to configure the permanent generation uh, and increase the size. It's called minus XX max perm gen, and you should specify it whenever you get an out of memory in your permanent generation. Okay? You can increase it to whatever value that you like. Um, usually it will be it will happen a lot earlier in your pro in development process than compared to Java code. However, this is not the, the only parameter that you may need to change. A second one is called the code cache size, and the code cache is the area where the JVM holds the optimized code. If you have more uh, byte code, you will probably have more optimized code and you should consider increasing this number because when the JVM reach to the limit of the code cache area, it will stop its optimization. In some versions, in, in newer versions, it will um, throw away a lot of the optimization that it did and we start all, all again from, from about half of the, of the size of the code cache. So this area of memory should be monitored, and you can monitor it with the tools that I have told you about them before. Okay, you should see if you reach to the state when it is depleted. If not, if it is depleted, you will not get an out of memory error, but, but you will have less performant application. So here comes the bug in my presentation. That was the slide about the specialized classes, which generates a lot of classes, and this is the parameter of the permanent generation. Okay, so that's the permanent generation, and just one note regarding it, in Java 8, the permanent generation is a history. Uh, it's going to be thrown away and replaced by, by a, a term called the metaspace, which means actually that you will need to tune something else. But that's for the future. So we've covered stack, and we've covered permanent generation and memory. And now I'm going to talk a bit about performance. Optimization. Scala compilers performs optimizations on top of the optimizations that the JVM performs. Um, usually the, the, the Java compiler is very stupid. It takes a Java co a class and compiles it to bytecode, and he does not do any optimization at all 
All the optimizations are left to runtime, to the JIT compiler, which compiles the bytecode to uh, assembly code eventually. But the Scala compilers, the Scala compiler needs to do some optimization by, by itself. And if, if you want to apply them, you will need to add the minus optimize parameter to your compiler. So how much better the code will perform, it depends on your application. A lot of people report that it didn't make much change, but I understood that there are cases that it can really uh, improve performance. However, it will slow down your compilation. For example, inlining and sometimes, as a result, boxing and unboxing elimination can be done only with the optimized uh, parameter. So I recommend it to add it to your compilation when your code gets to production. Yeah. Can it ruin the performance as well? No. <laughs> it can ruin the performance of the compiler. <laughs> okay. Inlining. Maybe, yes. Yes. For when you're uh, working on your or your on your desktop and, and compiling on the time, maybe it's not a good idea to add it just to your uh, integration systems. Um, inlining. Inlining means that you take a function and you embed it in the caller code, that you no longer call it anymore and it is just like a, a normal code that it's embedded inside another method. Both the JVM and the Scala compiler can perform inlining. Okay, Scala can do it when you add the mi minus optimized uh, parameter and sometimes it can do a better job than the JVM. If you really, um, it is good to have uh, inlining and as I said, minus optimize will get it for you. If you really want to know if a function is inlined by the compiler, you will need to add the compiler uh, parameter minus log double dot inline and then you will see which methods are inlined and where they were inlined into, okay? If you really expect that a method will be inlined and it is not, then um, you can add an annotation that I will show you later on. The fact that a method did not inline by the Scala compiler does not mean that it will not inline by the JIT compiler afterwards. The JVM can still optimize it and reach the optimal performance uh, after, after that. And if you want to see if a method is optimized and inlined, you can add it to the JVM which runs the application the, par the parameters print compilation and print inlining. For print inlining, you will need to add unlock um, diagnostic VM options, which means that this is not these are not parameters that are good for production and just to understand if your code behaves as you expect. If a method is not inlined by the um, JIT and not inlined by um, the Scala compiler, you may consider add the inline uh, keyword to a method. It is a very bad practice to do it all the time, just when it is really, really important. As you all know, access to Scala members and fields is always done by a getter and setter. Unlike Java, that you can access the fields directly, in Scala you access through getter and setters. Of course, if the object is immutable, only getters, and if it's mutable, then setters and getters. You shouldn't worry about performance of this because the JVM always optimizes setters and getters method. You will not get any performance penalty for using setter of getters instead of accessing directly members of a class. If you really want, if you insist on getting the penalty, you can give the JVM a parameter use fast accessor methods minus and it will not inline accessor methods, okay? One more thing about uh, performance is the parallel collections. All 
not all, some of the, of the collections in Scala have parallel counterparts. It means that they can perform some of the operations like folding, filtering, mapping in parallel. Okay? It is very easy to use, however, it is not <laughs> easy to use correctly. Behind the scenes for parallel collections, it is used, um, it uses the fork joint framework. The fork joint framework, which is a framework uh, to utilize a parallelism of, of fine grained operations. Um, for example, if we have a vector and we want to map it to plus one, to add one to every member of it, we can use the par uh, version of the vector and do the map on the par version of the vector. It's very easy to do, but if you will do that, you will not get any performance boost. Actually, for me, it runs slower than uh, the original version, just applying map. Okay, and it created a, a set of threads, and it ran the code um, in parallel on several threads, but it didn't get any performance boost. So use the parallel collection only when you know. Yes. As far as I know, it is possible for you to to tell to even tell him which uh, thread pool to use. As I said, it used a fork join framework, and as so th I believe the answer is yes. yes. Okay? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Usually you will want the thread, the, um, you will not, it, you will want the fork join framework to be the executor service because if it will not be the fork join framework, it will be, it will have very bad performance. But yes, you can specify an executor service and you control everything with the amount of parallelism and how you want to control it. Okay. So use it only when you have a performance bottleneck and only when you prove that it really improves your code. Regarding profile, yes. How much? Ten minutes is great. I think that we'll, I will finish in time. Um, regarding profilers, the JVM as a platform has extremely powerful profilers which enables you to pinpoint where performance uh, problems are residing. And Scala is no exception. You can take a very complicated application and run it and find the hotspots, the places that consume most of the CPU and most of the time of your application. There are several com commercial prof uh, compil uh, profilers which are very powerful, such as Yorkie, JProb, and JProfiler. And also there is a, J a profiler in the JDK called JVisualVM. Unfortunately, again, understanding Scala stack traces and, and stack flow is a bit more complicated than in Java. For example, a for loop in Scala will convert into uh, a, a few method calls to each other. And for each method call, you will need to get used to the fact that not everything is um, what you see. Not, not everything that you see in the profiler is easily, uh, you will need to, to do the transformation yourself. I hope that eventually there will be plugins for profilers that will show uh, Scala code in a more, uh, how do you say it? Profound in, in, in a more way, in a way that is more correlated, corresponds to your code. Um, just I want to mention that there are two mechanisms for uh, profiling. One of them is called sampling and the other one is called instrumentation. All the profilers give both of the mechanism. The sampling is using like stack traces. And it samples the process every now and then, every frequency that you decide, and will give you a statistic of what happens in your process. Uh, instrumenting profiler is some 
profiler which instrument your code, change your code, and injects code to measure time in all of your methods. Whenever um, you don't need the extra power of an instrumenting profiler, use sampling profiler when possible. It has lower overhead and it's probably will get you, um, it will be easier to start with. Only when you are uh, trying to solve more um, advanced problems, use the instrumenting profiler. Okay. Um, the last topic that I want to to talk about is um, garbage collection. And garbage collection is something that is very crucial for the JVM. You don't handle object deallocation. The JVM do it for you. And this process can be, uh, while very convenient, and if it doesn't work correctly, usually what will happen is that your performance will get hurt. So there are two things that uh, you need to take into consideration. The first is that Scala code uses immutability. And immutability means that every time, as Shimi mentioned before, every time you uh, change an object, you actually create another one. And that may seem to, to cause performance problems, but it's not always the case. First of all, most of the objects that you create are short-lived. You create them and they are deleted. And the garbage collection of the JVM can handle short-lived objects very efficiently. Garbage collection of, of short-lived objects is very fast and very efficient and usually does not pose any uh, performance problems. In addition, there is an optimization of modern JVMs that is called escape analysis. Whenever the JVM understands that an object allocated does not escape a scope of a method, it will skip its uh, creation on the heap and it will create it on the stack instead. So there are cases when even though objects are created, they are not really generated by the JVM. And of course, there is another side of immutability is that it is more easily parallelizable. So the fact that you're using immutability doesn't mean necessarily that your performance is going to be damaged. However, the way to test it is to use what is called allocation hotspots. In a profiler, for example, even in J, J Visual VM, you can operate it in such a way that it will find you the places in your code that allocates most of the memory. Okay, it's called allocation hotspots. And you can ask him to record allocation stack traces for every object that is created. And you will get uh, some kind of a histogram that will tell you where are the places in the code that allocates most of the object and what are the kinds of the objects that are allocated mostly. If this is, becomes a performance hot, uh, bottleneck, you will be able to optimize and solve the, the performance problems directly on such, um, on such places and leave all the other code intact because usually it won't be the problem of you. The last thing I, do, I want to talk about, how much time do I have left? Five, Five minutes, that's great. Is large immutable state. Suppose that you have a graph of objects and you, the graph is very large and it contains the state of your application. Usually it doesn't change, but from time to time there are changes to it. If the graph is immutable and it's not handled or modeled correctly, a small change can imply a huge change of all the objects. Objects that are not short-lived if changed frequently and in a very um, massive way can really damage the performance of your JVM. 
garbage collection can get into very uh, busy uh, phases and it can stop your application, it can damage your throughput and it may be very problematic. Sometimes it is deeply inside in the architecture of your application and you need to be aware about it, but sometimes you can just make small changes that, that will help you to solve it. But what's mostly important is that you will need visibility to this process. And the visibility to such a process goes through uh, garbage collection logs. Garbage collection logs are written every time uh, a garbage collection happens and they record how much time it took, how much memory they freed, and how they behaved. Usually, garbage collection logs are not operated by default, but I really recommend you to add garbage collection parameters to all your production systems and monitor the garbage collection activity by adding minus uh, print GC details, specify the log file name, also record the timestamps, and in Java 7, you also have uh, what is called log file rotation. Uh, the JVM will hand, hand them, handle the, the log files and the rotation automatically. After you have such log files, you can use uh, tools to view it. One open source tool, it's called GC Viewer, and GC Viewer can view um, these log files that are created and can give you a report if there is a problem in your application or there is no problem in your applications. There is an alternative that is called Tesnum. It's a commercial tool. It also does a very good job in analyzing these log files. Okay? Um, it is not an easy task to tune garbage collection, but the first step is visibility, to see what's happening in your application. That's all. To sum up, this means that you take the slides, fold left, and sum all the content. Don't be afraid of Scala. You will be able to optimize large-scale applications. Um, do the optimization only when you need it. No need to optimize code everywhere. and when it comes to understanding the, the Scala terminology in Java tools, you will need to, to start and adapting and to see how each Scala class and how each Scala construct uh, translates to a JVM construct. So you will need to know Java and the JVM in order to optimize Scala. That's all. Any questions? Yes. I have I have bad ex experience with G1. G1, uh, to my experience, was not performing better than CMS. Uh, unfortunately, I hope that it will improve. I last time I checked, it was about six months ago. Maybe it improved since then. I'm planning to to check it again soon. Any other questions? Yes. Performance of Scala collections. Yes. What do you want to know? Okay. What's my take about it? It's, it's very simple. It doesn't matter. Why does it, it doesn't matter? Because most of the time, it is not going to be your performance bottleneck. Whenever it is your performance bottleneck, you can detect it with tools and optimize it specifically. Of course, that a lot a, a more work can be done when using Scala collection, but consider how much boilerplate you, you, set, you conserve when using them. You write less code, you write the code faster, you have less bugs, you have much more time to optimize it. Eventually, you will be able to reach a much more, much more performing uh, application because you will have more time doing so. 
But yes, the R construct that will be slower than just doing a, a, a very nasty for loop in Java. Yeah, I'm talking about the Java collection stuff. So oh, you're talking, oh, you're Java talking about Java collection. Yes. OK, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, I, I'll put it that way. It is possible that certain things that you do will become slower than other alternatives. If they fail to, to, to work fast enough for you, you can use other constructs to get the same mechanism but it needs to suit your application. Um, I can think about scenarios when, for example, immutable map will be much slower than other alternatives, as you will need uh, to, to copy parts of it uh, from time to time when you create it. Constructing it can be slow. But afterwards, after it's constructed, it should be really fast. OK? okay. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Okay. Because the other talk is, is done and we need to move on with the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, five minutes and then we group.